the official radio show and podcast of the Society of Graduate Students at Western University. I'm your host, Sarah Clapman. And I'm your co-host, Yusuf. And today we are here with Liam Clifford. So welcome to our show, uh, Liam. Thank you very much for having me. So um, I guess we would want to begin by knowing more about you, how you came to be interested in doing a, a master's here at Western in history. Yeah, so to begin, um, I've always loved history. You know, ever since I was young, history has been a passion of mine. Even in grade school, I remember, you know, excelling in that discipline. And, you know, I would always be the the brunt of all jokes with my friends and family saying, how could you like such a boring subject? You know, what, what, what you know, to what extent is that going to help you? And, you know, it, it never, it never inhibited my my desire, my passion to to continue to further my studies. And um, throughout my undergrad at U of T, um, I did a double major in history and political science, um, trying to keep those two avenues open. And um, I decided to take the history route um, for the 2019-2020 academic year with a master's of history at Western. Very neat. So do you think you could uh, tell us a little bit more about you know, what it is you study specifically, because history is pretty broad, and I'm sure you're sticking your claim in some, some small area. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a fair point. You know, I, I always find that, you know, announcing that I study history, again, is, 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 is an exceptionally vague statement to make. Um, so I would be more than welcome to uh, elaborate a little more. Um, so currently, my research focuses on generally speaking, cultural genocide in Ireland. I focus on one particular book um, by the name of, the author's name is Michael Hector, and he wrote a book called Internal Colonialism, The Celtic Fringe in British National Development. And this book was written in 1972. And essentially I'm using this book to talk about how internal colonial structures in Ireland helped created the dogma that would then be used to perpetrate cultural genocide in Ireland. Now, when we speak about cultural genocide, we're often speaking about two particular groups. Um, so first we have our core foreign group. So the core group is the group that society centers itself around. It's the group that um, society um, you know, has, is given its structure from. Um, and it's important to note that this core group is normally foreign to the land in which it is it is making itself um, the, the you know the main subject group. Um, and the, on the other hand, we have an indigenous what we call peripheral group. So the indigenous group obviously would be um, the Catholic Irish in Ireland, um, but they're made peripheral by the core group through the dogma that they perpetuate. So examples like this would be, um, for example, the destruction of language or um, the destruction of institutions. Um, and this is something that I feel is really important to make mention of because I was reading this book and I was saying, my God, there's so many parallels with cultural genocide here that this internal colonial theory is, is suggesting. So my contribution to the research is being able to link these two previously unconnected terms um, and justify how cultural genocide in Ireland did, did take place against the Catholic Irish. Well, that's, I mean, I guess dogmas can become quite scary as you were suggesting. Could you tell us more about the dogma and how it was used as an effective tool to, to further that agenda and also more about the destruction of languages and institutions as well? I'd like to, we'd like to know more about that. Yeah, absolutely. So dogma is broken down into three main sections by, by Hector's book. It can be ethnic, it can be cultural, or it can be racial. Um, so these are three, you know, fairly broad categories, but important nonetheless um, to help explain how this continues to erode um, the culture of the targeted group. Um, so for example, in the case of language, a lot of native Irish Catholics uh, spoke what we call Osquelga or the Irish language, um, which is a language that still exists to this day. It's part of the Celtic languages group, um, but is often overshadowed by English in Ireland. Um, so what we see here, for example, is in the 16th century during the Elizabethan era, when the Elizabethans uh, implemented statesmen in Ireland to exact control over the island, what we saw were uh, policies implemented by the crown in order to help suppress the Irish language in what was, at least in my opinion, 
cultural genocide in the case that they saw this language as a threat to their own hegemony of power and then decided to suppress it. And there's a quote by uh, an Elizabethan statesman by the name of William Gerard from the 16th century that says, can the sword teach them to speak English? And I think this is a very prominent example, not only of how policy helps the erosion of culture and the contribution of cultural genocide, but how military conquest was also used as well in a couple examples of dogma. Interesting. There, when you talk about uh, internal colonialism, it's obviously got real relevant applications in a Canadian context as well with a, a very different cultural group. Um, what does it mean for colonialism to be internal? I've never heard that term before. Yeah, so colonialism is again it's it's a it's a broad stroke of a paintbrush, right? You can you can divide it into so many ways and you know it, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but the example I'm sure you're referring to in the Canadian context is the experiences of of indigenous peoples um you know during the white settler colonial phase that you could possibly still argue we we still live in today, which is very important um, to make mention of. Um, but in regards to internal colonialism, what we see here is not something that would reverberate the overseas colonialism of European empire or a land-based empire like Russia. What we would see here instead is a close proximity between two groups in the relative same geographic area and one of these groups conquering the other for lack of better term through the dogma and exacting their control over that group so what is internal about uh ireland's case is that ireland for uh, years of its existence um, was actually part of the United Kingdom. It was granted quasi-independence in 1921 and then would continue to be an independent country throughout its existence. So internal colonialism is important in this facet because what we see is quite a few European nation states utilizing this uh, formula, for lack of a better term, um, to help facilitate their nation building. So what we see here is the example of the Irish in Ireland perpetrated by the English, or another European example might be the Basque people in France and Spain. We see how Castilian Spanish slowly overtook the Basques and incorporated with them within the Spanish nation state, or how Parisian culture slowly absorbed the Basques in the, if my, if my knowledge of geography is correct, the southwest part of France. Um, and along with um, the experiences of African Americans um, in the United States or Black South Africans in South Africa and how um, white, the white hegemony in that regard um, would implement policies which were internal but colonial in the same regard to help suppress um, another contributing group of society. Well, Liam, thank you for that internal sense of colonialism. That's pretty fascinating, actually. I didn't even think about it in those internal, external senses. Mm -hmm. I guess uh, I was also thinking about your interest in Russian geopolitical um, sort of interventionist approaches. What do you think are their interests and their goals in sort of intervening um, in various conflicts? Well, uh, you know, Russia is, you know, an example that continues to be pertinent in, in our day and age. I, I took a couple of courses this year in the history department, one with Professor Aldona Senzikis, um, where we actually questioned whether the Cold War was actually over. You know, was right. the event of the Cold War over, but was this sort of um, antagonism between the United States and Russia really over? And, you know, it was it was certainly tough to come to a conclusion. And uh, another course with Professor Marta Dichak, who will be my supervisor next year um, in political science, um, spoke about how Russia as an empire needs to be compared in the same guise as uh, the British or French overseas empires in how they perhaps didn't go overseas, relatively speaking, obviously, they went overseas to Alaska and, you know, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. But they were colonial and, imper and imperial in the sense that they still conquered native indigenous populations 
and attempted to either russify them or you know make them more british as they did in india or you know make them more french as they did in french indochina so in regards to that that's why we see russia as you know this large you know spanning landmass at the top of the eurasian continent now in regards to their interventionist policies um we obviously see russian intervention in ukraine um you also see Russian support um, for separatist movements in uh, South Ossetia and Abkhazia in what is recognized in today's Georgia. And I personally think that it's a way to continue to destabilize the West and destabilize these countries who are continuing to lean West, such as Ukraine, who had the Euromaidan uh, protest, or um, Georgia, who have, who have allied themselves with the West as well. And why do you think um, it would be important for them to destabilize these sort of um, areas as well? What is the gain that they get? What's the end goal, I guess? I think I think the end goal in this case is to help consolidate their, their geopolitical stability. Um, I think that in the case of South Ossetia, um, there are massive oil and gas pipelines that run through this, you know, semi-autonomous region, whatever you want to call it. It, it's, it, it really exists in a legal gray zone in the international sphere. Um, so I think, you know, securing their borders is, is of utmost importance and ensuring that countries in which they feel they can exact influence over, which, you know, for example, Belarus or the Baltic states, um, who have since allied themselves with both NATO and the European Union, um, you know, they're going, they're going to continue to try to pull at those strings to um, take advantage of, you know, the areas in which encompass their former empire. Interesting. It's it's also interesting just from um, a Canadian perspective to talk about all these regions because we've had so many waves of immigration of these same peoples come over over the course of the last uh, few hundred years. I mean, every nation you name, not the very small former mm -hmm. USSR states, but you, you can think of just, you know, waves. Do you think that um, the ways in which they've experienced this kind of internal colonialism has affected how they've settled and then and then shaped Canadian culture? I, I think it's an interesting point, and you know what? It my I, I would be lying if I said my research focused a lot on you know the Canadian perspective. Um, how, how, whenever you know studying in Canada, I do think it's a, it's important to address. You you do you do find that um, in particular cases, um, depending on where these people are coming from, um, they may you know, they may embody a sense of their own group identity, as well as their national identity. So in the case, again, you know, we'll, we'll use um, the example of, you know, the Basques, again, you know, being able to, to cling on to what is Basque culture, and the Basque language, um, may, may be slightly differentiated from clinging on to what is Spanish culture, or what is what is French culture. And I mean, France and Spain have different ways of dealing with it. France is a very centralized government, whereas Spain is divided into autonomous communities, giving the Basque power much more, um, you, you know, much more power than, you know, like, than they do in France. So in, in regards to the Canadian perspective, I, I do think that immigrants um, embody a sense of self and the group that they perhaps maybe primordially ideal with, um, you know, um, uh, think of themselves as. Um, but you know, through the education system that they've been brought up in, perhaps also um, to the national state as well. Yeah, I just, I, I did my um, undergrad in on the east coast of Canada, and there's a very, mm. very powerful, um, generally sort of UK presence, but especially Irish and Scottish. So when you talk yeah. about, you know, sort of Irish nationalism, I think about how there's so much Gaelic that's been preserved in Cape Breton, for instance, when it was at real danger of going extinct in parts of, of Ireland. Yeah, and I, you know what, I think that's an interesting point, because in Ireland, we call um, predominantly Irish-speaking regions Gwail talks. Um, it means just, you know, a region in which Irish is spoken. Um, and the only actual permanent Gwail talk is actually, I believe it's just outside of Kingston um here in Ontario so it's 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 quite quite an interesting tidbit um so I guess that's a shameless self-promotion for them as well but um 
but it, it you know especially um you know i i had been fortunate enough to go out to newfoundland last summer and you know this year um irish scottish english welsh um sort of the nations from the british isles and the influence that they have um in that part of canada and and throughout the rest of the country is uh is paramount either through language or through um dance or you know other other facets of culture so it's really it's really interesting to see how that how it kind of branches off and you know forms its all its own branches of culture if you will hmm. Right. Um, why would you think uh, it would be helpful to, say, analyze the geography of Russia, Russia as well for your research? I think the, you know, the analysis of Russia's geography is, is so important, um, you know, especially in a world where um, geopolitics is becoming so essential, right? You know, we were, you know, as human beings, we rely on, you know, non-renewable resource in oil and how you know kind of going forward this is something that's you know that's not going to be present in in you know 100 years time or so you know i know i don't pretend to be a, a, a geography major but um you know these are considerations we you know we have to make so um demonstrating the sheer diversity of uh, of russia's geography is super important because you know it, it spans I think almost 11 time zones or something ridiculous like that. Um, you know, we go from Mediterranean climate down in Sochi and, um, you, you know, go to um, across to Kamchatka. You know, the, the, this is the peninsula that is heavily volcanic and, you know, is is almost like a frozen tundra. And then you have Moscow, which is, you know, more temperate climate and then the vast steppes, you know, this is, this is a country that, you, you know, if you continue to drive in, you, you'd, you'd see four seasons in a day, just like we do sometimes here in Canada, which is, which is crazy. But um, I, I, for, right. for me, the most important thing is, is ensuring that, you know, people understand just how anomalous Russia is in its vast, um, resources and and climatic diversity. Mm. Thank you. I uh, it's interesting that you study Russia. You mentioned in in some of the material that you sent us ahead of time that um, I think it's probably fairly obvious what got you started on studying Ireland, um, mm. but that there are so many parallels to to the Russian history and experience. And would you mind elaborating a bit on that? Yeah, so my my interest with Russia really started um, from a, a a passion surrounding the Cyrillic alphabet. I thought it was just I th it, it seemed so foreign and and alien to me, and it was it was something I just kind of wanted to learn a bit more about. And you know, you you would start off with with funny websites where um, you know you translate your your name from a Latin script into a Cyrillic script, and and see what kind of what kind of strange and wonderful letters would come up, and and you know what they mean or what they sounded like, and I think the Cyrillic look alphabet has 32 letters as opposed to the latin script has what 26 so um you know it was like yeah, i just just found it to be um again something you know that i did in my own spare time to broaden my horizons and this has since um really kind of broadened my scope and you know opening myself up to you know why study russia you know russia's been so prominent in the media over the last couple of years especially since you know the 2014 invasion of 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 the crimea the crimea and the donbass so uh, i i think that you know you know a passion turned into something that was you know you know that was real that was this again the word is anomalous you know i think I think Winston Churchill once said that Russia is something along the lines like a, you know, a mystery wrapped in a riddle, wrapped in an enigma or something like that. You know, don't quote me on that, but, but he had a quote about Russia, um, you know, in the famed uh, Iron Curtain. So um, that's kind of where my, my passion sparked from. So in the context of um, internal colonialism and um, well, cultural genocide as well. What can you say or tell us about the English treatment of Irish? Yeah, well, you know it. It's 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 a it's it's a layered question, um, especially when you ask uh, an Irish person that you know someone who has been born and bred to uh, to to love the English since since uh, since I left the <laughs> womb. But um, I, you know, uh, part of my part of my research is trying to make it objectively accurate as possible right you know it's it's very obvious that i will have bias right you know it's very obvious that 
that there are certain political aims with it. However, um, what what we do find consistently is that, you know, through um, the dogma that has occurred in Ireland, um, this has justified the use of plantations in Ireland, which where um, English and Scottish settlers were sent to various parts of Ireland to essentially dilute the, the Irish Catholic presence or, you know, the Cromwellian military conquest, you know, the siege of Drogheda is, um, you know, a, a, a military event that sticks out in a lot of Irish people's minds where, where Cromwell slaughtered an entire, an entire city um, on Ireland's Eastern seaboard. So, um, you know, essentially cheery stuff as you will, you know, um, but um, apart from that, the, we talked about the destruction of language, um, but we haven't mentioned um, how important religion is in this case. Oh, yeah. Um, the, the the British or, you know, what were, what were the English um, before the, the formation of the United Kingdom? Um, the island of Great Britain was predominantly Protestant, um, whereas most of the island of Ireland was Catholic. And um, during the Reformation, obviously, um, religious tensions continued to build um, and the English monarch, which would then become the British monarch, um, implemented what they called penal laws. So these were essentially laws that guided life for Roman Catholics in Ireland. So it would limit them on the, the guidelines of being Catholic. So Catholics were not allowed to... Um, uh, be joined the bar in Ireland, like the legal bar. Um, they weren't allowed wow. to possess firearms. They weren't allowed to um, become members of parliament or run or run for election in parliament. You know, so we see we see the perpetuation of cultural genocide on a number of fronts. We have religion, we have language, um, and it's it's really interesting to see because an article by Muhammad Abed in 2015 um, called "The Concept of Genocide Reconsidered" talks about how cultural genocide occurs in two facets: it occurs in a tangible way and an intangible way. So, intangible being, you know, the the less, um, you know, the obviously the less tangible um, facets of of society, such as language or religion, something we can't touch but we feel and we observe, um, whereas tangible cultural genocide would be the physical destruction of say for example places of worship or you know um cultural cultural buildings or, or you know some sort of some sort of um physical structure that that meant something to the group in which the in which the cultural genocide was contributing to so um there's there's a lot of different facets in and how cultural genocide manifests itself right i was just uh, just a follow-up i guess so what do you think is more it's worse um, in terms of tangible, uh, tangible approaches to colonialism or intangible ones, and why? You know what? Again, there. You know, it's a it's a great question that you know. I wish I had a crystal ball to tell me all the right answers, but I think at the end of the day, um, I'm I'm going to sit on the fence and say that um, both are equally bad. Um, both, are, and I mean, bad's not even a word for it. You know, these are these are atrocities. These are you know, these right. are people being devoid of you know their very essence of 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 who they are and who they've been raised to be. Um, and you know, this is not just limited to Ireland. You know, as Sarah mentioned earlier, this. Um, this scope um, is brought into um, indigenous peoples, not only in Canada, but in other white settler colonies. This is, this branches off to, you know, black South Africans in apartheid South Africa, this, you know, black, uh, black Americans in, uh, in the United States. So this is, this is not something that should be taken lightly, regardless of whether it manifests itself in a tangible or intangible form. Thank you. So, now that you have all this knowledge about uh, internal colonialism and putting together these disparate but important concepts, what would you like your research to do going forward? Is there some goal you'd like to accomplish or knowledge you'd like to share? I think, um, at least at the end of the day, you know, my main goal was to make sure that I presented um, something that I felt strongly about, something that, you know, came across as not only strong in its message, but strong in its objective accuracy. Um, and obviously, you know, coming from one particular background, you know, that, you know, there, there are some troubles or, you know, some obstacles rather with that. However, um, I do find that my goal 
first and foremost is is to create you know high quality academic work and you know this is something that um i continue to to um you know to 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 want to strive to to achieve um i think at the end of the day um for me um being able to continue as as an academic is something extremely important to me and you know i was I, again i was surprised with how similar the two terms were so i think you know being able to create that bridge you know i don't want to say fill in the gaps and be and be super cliche or or you know drop an idiom but um i do i do find that their similarities are too good um to be just coincidental liam uh this has been very fascinating for all of us and I'm, i'm pretty sure that uh, sarah and ariel Absolutely. as well um it's you've shown such a breadth of uh, knowledge and information as well and insight so it's been very insightful for me as well um and i wonder uh, do you say for example see yourself as a professor and uh many, many years from now you do a phd or also where would your focus where do you think you're heading to given that you you are easily able to jump from one field to another field that is somewhat similar i guess yeah no i think i think the dream uh, would be to be a professor i think that Great. at the end of it you know for me uh you know doing a phd was was always a life goal of mine it was always a you know an aspiration that i sought to achieve and 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 knew that i could um it just it just took the correct time and and circumstance to be able to achieve that so um going forward i think being a professor would be a sweet gig um you know not not only in terms of the, of the obvious benefits but but really being able to to connect with students whether that would be in uh you know a low fee seminar or you know a, a large a large undergrad um yeah lecture you know uh so Uh, you know and and you get me excited saying that I'll be honest because um that's 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 something I've been I've been passionate for a long time about and uh I think just being able to give back to students who would share the same interests as me um would be um would be an absolute buzz amazing mm mm-hmm. thank you okay um well i think we're just about out of time um thank you so much for coming on Uh, if anybody wants to learn more about your research Liam is there a website they can go to an email they can reach you at or do you have any social media that you'd like to share Yep I can share that now if um the listeners ears are perked up um I have a professional twitter um it is L as in Liam N as in Nigeria J as in Jack Clifford that's C L I F F ORD you can follow me there a lot of great professional content on there subscribe for more <laughs> terrific thank you okay well this has been gradcast the official radio show and podcast of the society of graduate students at western university i've been your host sarah clapman and my co-host was yusuf hasan um this episode was produced by ariel frame and we've been speaking with liam clifford If you'd like to be involved with the show or get in contact with us, email us at gradcastradio@gmail.com. You can follow us on Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter at gradcastradio. To listen to us, we are on the radio at CHRW 94.9 FM. You can also find all of our episodes on our website at gradcast.ca or on podcast apps like Podbean, iTunes, and Spotify. Alternatively, select podcasts have been uploaded to YouTube at Gradcast Radio. Thank you for listening and have a great night.